We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is to teach out of God's word. And we're in a series right now called The Mystery Of. And speaking of a mystery, I wanna start this morning with a little mystery. Anybody like card magic? I want to invite, uh, uh, I already invited someone to come up and be my volunteer. This is James. Everyone say hi to James. So in order to do this trick, right, I have to, just a regular bicycle deck of cards. And uh, so in this deck, what I need you to do, James, is you're just kind of follow me. So I'm going to make it easy. Just grab half of the deck so you have your own kind of stack, all right? So what we're going to do, you just, as long as you do what I do, you'll be fine. So I'm going to go into my deck and I'm going to pick out a card. I'm going to memorize it. And I'm going to set it down right here. All right. So now you get to do the same thing. You can look at them if you want. If you want to pick one that's like really meaningful to you, you can totally do that. If you, do you want to show it to everyone? Sure. It's, it's up to you. You can if you want. It's totally. All right. Everybody see his card. It doesn't actually matter uh, if I know what it is or not. I'll go ahead and set it down right here. So I'm going to take your card. And I'm going to put it face down in the middle of mine and just kind of lose it in there, right? Not save any spots. So you're going to take mine and lose it in the middle of yours without saving any spots. Just kind of... Tell them what yours is? No, you just put it in yours, all right? You're going to put mine in. It doesn't really matter if we know each other's cards. I guess you could have shown. Um, mine was the two of spades. Okay. What was yours? Three hearts. Three hearts. All right. So give me half of yours. All right. I'm going to take your half. I'm going to put it face up on my stack, and I'm going to take the other half and put it face up on the bottom. Can you confirm that? Yep. All right, so smush it all together. So now what I have here is a whole stack of cards. There are some face up, some face down. It's a total mess. How cool would it be if I could make all the cards face up? That would be pretty awesome. Just using magic. Go for it. I, it would be cool if I could do that. I can't do that. So, <laughs> um, what? but maybe... I could make all of them face up except for two and keep your card and my card face down. What would that be? That would be pretty cool, huh? So if I just use a little bit of magic, a little bit of magic, and all of a sudden they're all going to be face up, all right? They're all going to be face up except for two cards. What? What? And what did you say your card was? Mine was the two of spades and yours was the? Hearts. Three hearts. There you go. Yeah. Here, you take, will you just hold those for me? I do need them back, but yeah, thanks. Say thanks for James to help. Yeah. So I really enjoy learning card magic and magic tricks. And my favorite thing is when you're all done with a magic trick, right? That you want the, the, the people watching to think one question, right? Which is how, how did you do that? And some of you want to know right now, right? You want to know, how did he pull that off? What was the trick? You know that there's not actually magic going on. There was a trick at some point in there. And you, you want to know, some of you are going to go onto YouTube later today and spoil it, right? You're going to figure it out. Um, but that's the thing about the book of Ephesians. Because a book of Ephesians, every chapter as you go through the book, it's actually a letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus. And it's been broken up into six chapters that we read. And each chapter is really a, a, an answer. It's an unveiling, if you will, of a mystery. Chapter one, right? We talked about the mystery of God's will. In chapter two, it was the, the mystery of unity. And today we're going to talk about something else. But first, what Ephesians 3 does is it recaps the first two chapters in the first seven verses. So let's read those first seven verses together. Uh, you don't have to read out loud, just I'll put it on the screen. It says, when I think of this, all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you, exi or you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me this special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. 
And he says, as I briefly wrote earlier, right? So chapters one and chapter two, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. And as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. In other words, what Paul is saying is, in chapter one, remember, God revealed this mystery of his will to me, and then I revealed it to you, all right? And then he goes on. He says, God did not reveal it to the previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both now are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. And so that was the the second part of this was last week, right? The mystery of unity, that when we become followers of Christ, we become unified, we become reconciled into one body through Christ. And so if you think about it from a recap perspective, the mystery of God's will, here it is real quick, uh, a good, it's a good plan to be glorified by calling sinners back to himself through the love of Jesus. That was week one. Week two, the mystery of unity, right, is that through faith, all believers receive grace and mercy and are unified into one body, inheriting God's eternal blessings together. All right, so if we were going to take our message today and give you a pre-point, all right, right now on your, your little handouts, you have points one through five, I'm going to give you the one that comes before point one, which is point zero, all right? This is our recap point, and it's this. The mystery of the gospel is what we're going to talk about today. The mystery of the gospel, and the first point is this, that God offers undeserving people. Raise your hand if you're in the room right now and you're an undeserving person, all right? You don't deserve this gift, but God offers undeserving people an opportunity to receive the gospel and join into his family, right? So that's lesson one and lesson two. Go back two weeks ago and last week and watch those. We'll cover that really well, but but ultimately, this is the truth. We are undeserving. It's a mystery, yet God gave us this. So then the question is, well, what are we supposed to do? If you're in this room and you've already received this gospel. You're the undeserving person. I'm an undeserving person. We've given our lives over to Jesus. We now get to be part of his family. All right, well, well, what next? What do we do now? And there's actually a really uh, popular passage of scripture that answers this question. It's in Matthew. You can stay right where you are in Ephesians 3, all right? Keep your, your thumb there at least. In Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18, these are the last three verses of the book of Matthew. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, this is what you're supposed to do. Now that you undeserving people have received the good news of the gospel, you're now part of God's family. Here's what I want you to do. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here, here, this passage of scripture has kind of a well-known title. If you've been in church for a few months, you've probably heard it before. What do we call this passage of scripture? Say it with confidence. You know it. What is it? The Great Commission. Right? These are the the last words of Jesus before he's about to ascend back into heaven where he is right now. He's with the Father. And before he left, he said, listen, I've died on the cross for you. I've come back to life. And now I'm going to go be with the Father. But before I go, I want to give you kind of my last command for the church. All right? So it's his will that we would all undeserving people would come into a saving knowledge of Jesus through the gospel, that we'd be joined together into his family called the church, and that the church would take this good news out to the outermost parts of the world. That's what Jesus asks us to do with this information. It's our job to take the message out to the ends of the earth. Anyone in this room feel unqualified to do that? I can't be the only one. Well, I want you to know you're in good hands. Paul also felt unqualified 
I mean, Paul, he's like a, a giant of the faith, right? If anyone should be qualified to take the gospel, Paul's like the church planning master. And even Paul felt unqualified. It says in verse 8, we keep reading. It says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people. Talk about feeling underqualified. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. So here's, here's the first point I want to make. And the mystery of the gospel, all right, is the first one is this. God chooses undeserving and unqualified believers to share the gospel. I don't know why. Of all the people God could choose, of all the ways he could get the message out, for some reason, it's a mystery to us that Paul's trying to unfold, is that he chooses really unqualified and undeserving people. And he says, listen, you broken people, you messed up unqualified people, I want you to take this message of a perfect Jesus who died on the cross, rose again. I want you to take that message out to the world. It's a mystery. And Paul, I mean, why would he consider himself the, the least qualified, the least deserving? You know what Paul did before he was a, a church planter, before he became a missionary? Before that, Paul was the one actually hunting down the missionaries. He was the one finding the church planters. He was the one going and finding Christians and murdering them. He was responsible for, for uh, oppressing and persecuting Christians. And so Paul's thinking, I don't know why God chose me. I mean, how broken can you be? You come into this understanding of faith and you're coming in, walking in as a murderer of Christians. And he's like, and yet God has chosen me to take this message to other people? And the truth is, it's a mystery. One of the mysteries of the gospel is that God chooses you and he chooses me to take this message out to the world. See, one of the great mysteries is that, that you, believers, remember the mystery of unity last week, that we've been unified into one body. We have become the church, and God has given this commission to the church to fulfill. I saw this YouTube video a couple years ago, and it was a live recording, and the way it kind of was set up was one of those like antique roadshow type things where there's an expert and he's holding on to this spherical thing. I think it's supposed to be like a, a, a basically like an old record, but it was a spherical version of a record. And he was hold, standing next to like this player and he's holding it and he's saying, you, you don't understand how valuable this, this thing is. I think this might be the only one left. And he's holding. You can see as they zoom in on his hands, he's actually shaking as he's holding it. He's talking about it. He's like, this is invaluable. There's, there's no way to put a price tag on it. And as he's shaking and he's kind of fumbling with it, he, he breaks it in his hands. I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? God chooses to take the gospel, something far more valuable than some vinyl cylinder, and he says, I'm Matt, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to put it in the hands of the church. I'm going to put it in the hands of the unified body of Christ. And you all are responsible for correctly handling this thing and taking it out and displaying it and giving it out to the world. Wow, what a mystery. It is a mystery indeed. And he even goes on, not goes on, but if you go look back at verse 8, what does Paul say about this? He says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he says, he graciously gave me the what? The privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. How amazing would it be if we as the church saw evangelism, just a big fancy word for sharing our faith, if we saw the opportunity to share our faith as a privilege. I know oftentimes when I'm praying with our staff or at a staff meeting or an executive meeting or something, I'll often say something along the lines of, God, it is such a privilege 
that you choose us to serve you in this way. Such a powerful privilege that we have that God says, listen, you don't deserve it. You're really unqualified, but I'm going to give you the privilege of taking this message out to the world. That ought to be a mystery to you. Let's keep reading in verse 10 where we left off. It says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church, that's you and I, if you're a believer, okay, to display his wisdom in its rich variety to the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What in the world does that mean? You know, sometimes we read scripture so fast, we don't even realize that we just read something that should cause us to stop for a minute. It says that he's using the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to these unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And then it goes on to say, this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me tell you what this verse means. Number two, in the mystery of the gospel is that this level of responsibility that God has given to us, it even confounds the angels. It's such a huge mystery that the angels, these rulers in the heavenly places, are looking down at the amount of authority and responsibility God has put in our hands, and he's saying, they're saying, you gave it to Matt? He's going to drop it. He's going to drop it. Here's the way I think it would be helpful to understand this. Imagine if you got in a submarine, one of those little personal sized submarines, all right? It was really powerful. You could take it all the way to like uh, the bottom of the ocean. And there at the bottom of the ocean, it's so far down that no light from the sun even makes it down that far. But when you turn your little light on and you're looking outside the submarine, you're going to find that there's actually creatures, you know, crawling around down on the dirt down there that live in this darkness. They just live in perpetual darkness. They have no idea, right, that there's this another layer of the ocean where there's this thing called sunlight. They've never experienced that before. They have no idea that outside of the water there's this whole other world and that there's just animals and people and birds flying around. And they have no idea that, that that's all part of this this. You know, our planet is just one part of this solar system. Our solar system is part of the universe. And the universe is one of billions of other universes. They have no idea about any of that. And then imagine you got word that God decided to take one of these little creepy crawly little things crawling around in the mud and say, I'm going to use that thing to proclaim the gospel to the world. We would look at that and say, wait, what? Why would he use that thing? what scripture says is that in the kind of the same way, the angels are witnessing this plan that God has had from the very beginning to put the gospel in the hands of us. Here's what I would challenge you to think about this, right? The next time you get all high and mighty, remember that you're just a creature of darkness who has received an incredible gift of grace and mercy. I don't know why God chose humanity and said, I'm going to create you in my image. I'm going to have this special relationship with you. But the angels are watching this. Remember the angels that live with God, right? They, they've never fallen. They've never had a need to experience grace and mercy from God. And so they're watching this love relationship that God has with you and me. And they're thinking, wow, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't understand it. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. It says, Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly, don't forget that word, and confidently, don't forget that word, into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. Here's the third mystery of the gospel. Are you ready for this? Third mystery of the gospel is that we have full access privileges. It's like you're wearing a, a concert thing around your neck, right? And you get, and on it, it says that you have backstage access. I remember when I was in college, actually right after I graduated college, uh, I was asked to MC this Christian music festival called Winterfest in Virginia. 
It was a three-day it was a three-day festival. It was all the, the best Christian musicians of that day were all invited over a three-day period. And I remember that as the MC, right, I'm the guy who's on stage between different bands and musicians, making sure the crowd's having a good time, playing some games as they're getting the next drum kit ready and all this stuff, right? But one of the things that came with this job is this all-access pass. I could go backstage and into the green room and meet the newsboys and meet this and meet that. And I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. I could even bring people with me. If I was just hanging on to someone's hand, I'm like, hey, they're with me. The security would just open up. I would just be able to bring. I mean, it was awesome. Scripture says that we now have the access to go into the presence of God with boldness. How amazing is that? You read these words and it says we can go boldly and confidently into God's presence. Again, the angels are scratching their heads thinking, what's this? What did they do? Think about a space like like the Oval Office. Like most of us, we don't even have access to just get onto the grounds of the White House. But think, there are some people who have kind of access, as I'm sure it's a very few number of people that can just walk in and out of the Oval Office whenever they feel like it. But I bet if you're a child of the president, you'd probably have access to go in and out of the Oval Office. We actually seen pictures of that, right? JFK, right, his, his kids were just coming in and out. A lot of pictures of them playing there in the Oval Office, making it their own little play area. How cool is it to understand that somehow, because of the mystery of the gospel, of God's incredible love for us, this free gift of mercy and grace that he unified us together to become one body, that we now have access to go into the throne room of God. It's a mystery. Speaking of boldness, I want to show you another example of boldness in Scripture that's going to lead us to our next point. So Peter and John in the book of Acts, they, uh, they're basically now out. They're fulfilling the Great Commission. They're telling people about the good news. And they're, they're sitting there and some religious rulers are giving them a hard time for, for healing this guy. And, and here's what we read about in Acts 4 verse 8. It says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, uh, sorry, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And then don't miss this last part. It says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness. There it is. The boldness of Peter and John. They're going out, they're fulfilling the Great Commission, they're being the hands and feet of Jesus, and they go in and they get themselves in trouble, because that's that's what's going to happen, by the way, when you're the hands and feet of Jesus, you're going to get yourself into some trouble, and and they're, they're questioning them, and they says that they were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Why? It says, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. And then it goes on. This is really powerful too. It says they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. You see, it says that these guys were amazed at what ordinary people were capable of when they went out to fulfill the Great Commission. Ordinary people. Again, raise your hand in this room if you're an ordinary person. All right? If you didn't raise your hand, some neighbor, could you tell them there's nothing special, all right? <laughs> Here, here's the deal. Right now, upstairs, there are some ordinary people, ordinary people spending time with your children. But there's something special when you go upstairs because you can tell that those ordinary people have spent time with Jesus. There's ordinary people that were up on this stage leading us in worship just ordinary people. 
And yet, as we worship together under their leadership, it's clear to me as I'm worshiping, they've been in the presence of Jesus. And so another part of this mystery of the gospel is this, is this next one. You ready? Number four is that God qualifies those he calls. If he calls you into the Great Commission, he's going to qualify you to do it by his strength. By the way, you are, we've already agreed to this, okay? We are all unqualified. But God has called us, and then therefore he's saying, all right, listen, you're unqualified by yourself. So I'm going to give you access to my presence. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you everything you need. So you are now qualified to take this message out to the world. Let's keep reading. In Ephesians 3, verse 14 and 17. It says, when I think of all this, this is Paul speaking, right? When Paul thinks of all this, he says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Here's what this is saying. What Paul is saying is, listen, I understand that the people I'm writing this letter to, you're just like me, that you're unqualified. But I'm praying that as you grow in your understanding of God, that that, that the one who created everything, that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will be the one to empower you and give you strength. You think about it from like a perspective of a tree, right? We all understand this concept of a tree, that there's this whole part of the tree that we see above ground. And there's a whole part of the tree, sometimes just as big, maybe even bigger, that we don't see. Another tree that's just the opposite, underground, right? The root system. And the reason why these trees can withstand so much is because their roots grow, go deep and wide. There's these incredible root systems. And Paul is saying, I'm praying that your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Because here's the deal. Unless your roots are growing down into God's love, then you're just standing there on your own, in your own strength, and you, sorry to break it to you, are unqualified. You don't have it. You're not going to be able to pull it off. But you grow down with strong roots into the love of God, then you can stand strong because God qualifies those he calls. Here's the fifth one I have ready for us. Fifth mystery of the gospel statement today. By the way, this isn't a comprehensive list. All right, number five is it is too great to comprehend. The gospel is too great to comprehend, but it's worth trying. If it's worth trying to understand all we can about the goodness of of the gospel. And here's how Paul says this in verse 18. He says, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though, here it is, it's too great. It's too great. It is too great to understand fully. Not a single one of us in this room is going to be able to fully understand the mystery of the gospel. It's too great. It says, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. So what does this verse say? It says basically what we just talked about. You can't fully understand it, but Paul is praying for his church in Ephesus and for the church here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. He's saying, may you understand as much as you possibly can about the love of God. If we could understand how deep it is, how high it is, how wide it is, how long it is, this multidimensional thing called my love, just try to wrap your head around it. And if you do, we're promised this thing, right, called the fullness of life. If I were to say the number, I wrote down this number, it's called Quindecillion. Have you ever heard that number before? Quindecillion? 
Some people have probably heard of million. You've probably heard of billion and trillion. And after that, you're like, we just start making up numbers, right? We're like, guagali group a billion, right? We just say like a word. We're trying to say it's too big to understand. Well, quindecillion is a real number. It's a one with 48 zeros after it. It's a big number. Like the closest we could get to understanding it would be to like write it down on a piece of paper and say, ooh, my hand hurts, right? That's a big number. But you're not fully going to understand the size of that number. You know, if I said you had a one in quindecillion chance, you know, you're going to be like, I don't really know what that means, but I don't think I'm winning the lottery today, right? Like we don't really get it, but, but we know it's big. And what we can understand is that God's love for us, the mystery of the gospel, is that it is bigger than we could ever understand. And it's good. And it's awesome that we're not going to fully wrap our heads around it. So here's how we always end on a Sunday morning. We end with a three-word prayer. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, this prayer is up on the screen, and it says this, What now, God? And we want to encourage you to walk away today changed. That you don't come in this room and then leave the same way you came in. So ask God, what do you want me to do with this information we just learned from Ephesians chapter 3? What now? God, what do you want me to do with this? And here's what I want to encourage you to consider. Or what now, God? I want to ask you to consider this. Let him use you. He can do more than you think through you. Let him use you. He can do more than you think. I think there's probably some of you in this room right now, you've been praying about something. You've been feeling prompted to move forward. God's put something on your heart. He's given you a dream, a passion, something, and you've been like praying about it. You've been thinking about it. You've been wondering, you've been asking God, would you just give me some direction? And maybe right now you just needed to hear these words right now. Let him use you. He can do more than you think. Maybe that was the push you needed. But for every one of us in this room, I hate to break it to you. You're not going to be able to really do anything on your own strength. You are undeserving and you're unqualified. I'm not just picking on you. The same is true of me. I can't really accomplish anything on my own strength. But the mystery of the love of God, the mystery of the gospel, right, is that because he's given me this free gift of mercy and grace, he's extended to each one of you too. Those of you who accepted it, you've been united into one body, the body of Christ. You've been reconciled. you become part of this church. You now have, I don't know why, but God has even confounded the angels by giving you access to his throne room so you have his strength and his power so that you can take his message and share it with other people. I don't get it. Paul's done a really good job trying to explain it to us, but we're never going to fully understand it. Why? Why me? And then Paul finishes the chapter with one of the most famous prayers in scripture. Ephesians chapter 3 I want to pray this over you right now. You can keep your eyes open if you like, if you want to look at the words on the screen. But I just want you to know that this is Paul's prayer for the church. This is your pastor's prayer for you. And it goes like this. Now all glory to God, who is able, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So as we ask that question, why does God choose us? Like the mystery of the gospel, why does he choose us to take this thing out? Here's the best answer I think I can find for you in scripture today. And God doesn't choose you because of who you are. He chooses you because of what he knows he can accomplish through you if you let him. He knows what he can do through you if you let him. You're not going to be able to do anything on your own. 
He doesn't pick you because of how awesome you are. He picks you because of how awesome he is. He plans to reflect himself through your life. Let him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this revelation of something that we won't be able to fully understand, but we recognize your gospel is such an incredible gift to us. And you've made us you made it so that each of us have, have access to it. We're, we don't deserve it, but we can accept it. We can accept this free gift of mercy and grace and be accepted into this body of Christ called the church where you are the head. And we get to be a part of this thing. We get to be a part of your commission, your great commission. We get to be the ones who take the gospel out to our neighbor and to our family and to our coworkers and out to other places in this world. We get to be the ones, your hands and feet. God, we don't fully understand us, but we're so thankful you did. Allow us to be a church that opens up our hands and recognizes you can do far more through us than we give you credit for. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.